All right. We will go ahead and start. Um, my name's Becca Konimopoulos. I have the honor of moderating tonight's event um, called Salmon People, Indigenous Resistance and Resilience in Alaska. And we'd like to kick this event off um, by inviting Gloria Simeon, um, an elder by, by the mother uh, Kuskokwin River um, in Alaska to uh, share in land acknowledgement and a prayer so we can start in a good way. In the language of my people, Uyana Dailuchi, Huinga Alabachuk, Jalislu Jainak, Jabayum Banya, Dukkak Jalislu, Palagia Dutaulup, Mamklisur Miu Runga. Thank you, thank you for coming to this event. My name, in the language of my people, my two names are Alabachuk and Jainak. I am the daughter of Anita Gertz and the granddaughter of the late Chief Eddie Hoffman and his wife, Pelagia Tangmik. And I come to you from the banks of the Kuskokwim River. Land acknowledgement from my land, the banks of the Kuskokwim across the country, to this event in Washington, DC, to acknowledge all the people that have been on the land before us and the sovereign nations, the 574 sovereign nations that are represented, whether they are present or not. In prayer for this gathering, creator, bless this gathering of hope and unity to celebrate the resilience of our just being the sacredness of our lands and our duty and obligation that we have to protect and preserve our gifts. We also celebrate Secretary Deb D. Halland, the trailblazer, warrior of our people. Prayers for strength, courage, and humility. We ask you to bless the peoples and the nations represented that we strengthen our connection to the divine, to our own humanity and our responsibility as stewards of our lands to protect and support all life. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. And with that, we'll begin this event. And I want to acknowledge um, the people of these lands and waters, generations past and present and future and, and pay my respects. And I wanna thank you, thank all of our speakers tonight. We have Ruth Miller from Native Movement, Alana Hurley from United Tribes of Bristol Bay, Joel Jackson from the Organized Village of Cake and Gloria Simeon, who is um, an ethnobotanist and elder struggling to protect the uh, Yukon Kuskokwin Delta. Um, all of these speakers um, are from communities for whom salmon is um, not just a, um, a species, right, but rather a life way, um, a, a sacred um, living being. Um, and central to the identities of Native Alaska peoples. And here in the Pacific Northwest, where I'm calling in from, um, where the salmon are at risk of extinction, um, the Red Road to DC totem pole journey is the reason why we gather together today. The House of Tears Carvers of the Lummi Nation for the last 20 years have been organizing totem pole journeys, transporting totem poles to communities who are facing similar threats to sacred sites, lands, and waters. This year is the largest journey yet, and the Red Road to DC totem pole, 25 foot totem pole carved this year, is crisscrossing the country as we speak. And starting in mid-July, it will begin its journey to Washington, DC, stopping at communities along the way for ceremonies and live stream events, 
um, including the Snake River, Chaco Canyon, White Earth Reservation in Minnesota, and many more. As the totem pole travels, um, communities are invited to lay hands on it and become a part of its story. And they give the pole power and the pole gives them power in, in turn. And we are driving those prayers in that power um, and spirit of the land that the totem pole visits to the symbolic heart of the nation's capital to present the totem pole to the new administration and call for the urgent protection of sacred places under threat from resource extraction and industrial development projects. There are sadly many communities we cannot drive to and tonight kicks off our virtual totem pole journey event. Um, and I uh, want to invite everybody to follow along and join the journey at Red Road to dc.org. And I'm going to turn it over to Ruth Miller to begin the event with a meditation through the eyes of the salmon. Yahli do everybody. Shivaik is in Shiji, then in a Kanaga Shafun Kanashtu, Chayang as Venish Hitre. She does not have a Kendo Miller Shukta to Uwad Miller Shukta to U Akukasan Chukushikai Kilanda to U. My English name is Ruth Miller, my Denina name is Shabayak Eason, and my family comes from Pijnevena, Lake Clark area. We traveled down to Bristol Bay, uh, where we grew our family, and I grew up in Dachayikak, Anchorage, Alaska, in Denina territory. But today, I am so honored to be calling in from Salish Kootenai lands of uh, western Montana, where I've been finding some rest and relaxation with my family to, uh, to charge up for the long fight ahead. Uh, so today, um, I, you know, I come to this space as well as a storytelling fellow with uh, the Natural History Museum, Becca's organization and, and the um, uh, creators and sponsors of, of this event. Um, and I'm proud to offer a meditation, a, a bit of a visual exercise that I learned from my dear sister, Danielle Stickman, um, who um, is such a beautiful visionary um, and a leader in our community. I'm honored to have her permission to share this with you. So I'd invite everyone to first take a deep breath, the breath of life that gives us all centering and balance. And if you feel comfortable, please close your eyes. Just take a moment, turn off your camera as long on Zoom. And find within yourself that still water, that starts with peace. When I think of peace and balance, when I think of serenity, I think of the Kartish Nevena, our Vena, that on a windless day sits as still as glass reflecting the mountains above, showing us the depths, the bottom of the lake deep below. I think of our bay, Bristol Bay, on a cold and clear, still day, waves lapping at the shores. And as you bring yourself to the water, the nation in our language, think about that incredible power, the power to give life and the power to fight, the power to be still and gentle and the power to grow tidal waves. Feel that ebb and flow within your body. Imagine each heartbeat is pushing a wave to the shore, pressing it and embracing it, as well as nurturing life within. As you hold that water within you, think about the nourishment and the life and the creation story of that water, all of the life that that makes it sustains for us. Think of our most precious salmon that grow full and healthy waters that find the best food to eat that grow big and strong so that they can continue their lineage so that the salmon millennia millennia ago can pass on their DNA even now. Put yourself into the eyes of one of those salmon. Bring yourself back into your body. Imagine your slick and smooth skin. Imagine how easily you carve through the water. Imagine being in your place, having that feeling of belonging as you swim amongst other chica and salmon. And bring into your body the realization that it's time to come home. 
reach into your memory, the distant homelands, the place where you were born, is the place that now is time to return to. Bring your hands together and begin to swim upstream. Find those beautiful waters and follow the smell of your family, follow the smell of your memory, your heritage, your ancestry as you start to climb up river. Begin to swim faster as you get excited. Maybe you swim over some waterfalls. Maybe you swim past some beaver dams. Maybe you begin to move a little bit more freely, a little bit more excited as you start to pick up your energy, as you begin to use all your strength, every muscle in your body, creating that heat in your hands, just as the Sika find that heat in their bodies to push them all the way up to their ancestral birthing grounds. Remember that smell, remember that memory that instinctually guides you home. As you start to move your hands faster and faster, feel that heat grow. Feel that heat start to create life in your hands. As you're approaching the end of your time, know that you are creating life for the next generations. Know that the healthy waters that have nurtured you and helped you grow, that have given you every nourishment, every mineral that your body needs to survive is living within you. And that you as a salmon are a symbol of the health and wealth of so many villages you're passing by, so many kinds of people, so many native communities that rely on you, that share DNA with you. And finally, slow yourself down as you come back to that place where you were born, as you come back to that beautiful birthing ground that's been imprinted in your memory. And as you're lifted up out of the water, knowing that you're about to pass on your nourishment and your strength onto those that love you, find peace. And suddenly you're the fisherman. You're the fisherman pulling that beautiful fish out of the water, knowing you're about to feed your family. Stretch out your body as you start to reach for that fish and drag in your set net. <laughs> start to pick your fish out of the net. Next, we're gonna cut our fish like this. Make sure that you're appreciating and thanking that sika as you go. Now we're gonna brine that fish and hang her up to dry. Put her in the smokehouse, get in your body and stretch a little bit. Think of the celebration of life that exists for us as we begin our subsistence practices that were taught by our parents and our grandparents and our great, great, great grandparents for time immemorial. Think about how precious it is to pass on these practices from one another and suddenly come back to that creation moment, that moment of giving, that moment of ultimate life. Think about that interconnectivity, that reciprocity that ties us all together. Think about the joy that you feel knowing that you're part of the water, that you're part of the salmon, that you're part of a community that cherishes and loves those creatures like nobody else and with that happy memory, if you know the taste of smoked salmon, taste it in your mouth, picture it in your mind. It's my happiest memory, always on the side of our rivers, always on our coastline, honoring our shika, our salmon, tasting that smoked salmon in my mouth. Nothing can bring me better happiness, and I don't know anything that can make anyone else smile as much as the taste of fresh smoked salmon can. So with that, think about how much we're fighting for how much we have to save. You know, so often in this work, we get demoralized, we get upset, we get hurt because we are fighting against such injustices that come at such a great cost. But we have so much to fight for and we have so much beauty and so much love. So come back to those moments of oneness with the water, feeling that ebb and flow. Come back to those moments of gratitude for our shika, our salmon and our ancestral practices that remind us how to love them. I'm happy to share this space with each of you and I'm so excited to learn more from each of our leaders present here today, each of whom have deeply influenced me and who I am. So that chicken to Ukoyana, thank you all so much.
Thank you, Ruth, for, for that. I love that you took us on that journey. That does remind us what we're fighting for and fighting to hand down to the future generations. And that's a really fitting transition to Alana Hurley, um, who is a fisher and leader of United Tribes of Bristol Bay, and also um, uh, caring for her infant baby uh, tonight during this event while joining us to speak. Um, so a very concrete reminder of the future generations. And thank you, Alana. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, Oyana, um, thank you so much um, for, for having me. What an honor to be part of such a sacred journey and to be with such amazing speakers today. I just want to say, you know, thank you so much to the organizers of this event and to Lamy for this, you know, really amazing sacred journey that the, the poll is going to be on. And we're just so thankful to be a part of it. Um, as you said, my Irish name is Alana Hurley. My Yupik name is Achak. Um, I'm from Clark's Point and I live and work now in Dillingham and Bristol Bay, Alaska for United Tribes. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, United Tribes of Bristol Bay is a tribal consortium um, representing Yupik, Denin, and Alutak people who have called Bristol Bay home for millennia um, and who have been fighting for almost two decades to protect our way of life. Um, we represent over 80% of our region, um, which is in Southwest Alaska. And so, um, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with the pebble mine issue, um, but for those that aren't, uh, Bristol Bay is home to one of the last great sockeye salmon fisheries uh, left on the face of the planet. Fisheries that have sustained our people um, for since time immemorial um, and are critical to our, our physical well-being, our spiritual well-being, our cultural well-being. Um, and so our people have been fighting with everything we have for, like I said, almost two decades to protect exactly that, protect our right to be Yupik, Dene, and, and Alutuk people as our people have here for thousands and thousands of years. Um, this is a battle that we don't necessarily have a choice to be fighting. You know, we don't have a choice. Um, we have to fight. We have to fight because our ability to continue being Yupikdena and then Alutak people is what's at stake. Um, currently, um, or, or just to back up a little bit, you know, the, the Pebble Project would be one of the largest copper and gold mines at the headwaters of our fisheries and the headwaters of our entire watershed that um, really, you know, gives life and has given life to uh, all the plants and animals and fish that we've shared this place with forever. Um, and so it could not be at a worse location uh, when it comes to degrade, you know, devastating the lands and waters that our people have thrived on for thousands of years. Um, with that, many people may be aware that um, the permit, a, a major federal permit for the Pebble Project was denied in November. But unfortunately, that permit denial, while it was an amazing, great step for us, it um, does absolutely nothing to achieve permanent protections for our watershed and our people. And so <clears throat> you may also have heard that um, recently, the, one of the um, appeals that we had sued when Trump, the Trump administration rolled back previous proposed protections under the Obama administration is now able to move forward. Um, so really what that means to us is, is that the fact that the Trump administration interfered in EPA's attempt to protect Bristol Bay um, was not based on science, was not based on fact, and is just more reason for the Biden administration um, to make good on his campaign promises and finish what the Obama administration started and have the EPA veto pebble mine once and for all so our people can put this issue to rest that has haunted us for almost 20 years. Um, I know that there's a lot of good speakers today, so I don't want to take up too much time. Um, some things that people can do <clears throat> 
we, our tribes are really, really pushing for an EPA veto um, combined with legislation to protect our, broad, our broader Bristol Bay watershed. We have to have permanent protections in place. The permit denial that happened is not good enough. We do not have the protections um, to end what has become a generational curse. There is nothing stopping the company, even with the permit denial, from trying to develop again in the future. Um, or, or, and they're actively appealing that decision and, and trying to continue to develop the project. So we absolutely need our sisters and brothers from across the nation to weigh in um, and pressure the Biden administration and the EPA to veto this project um, once and for all. And you can do that by going to our website. I'll put it in the chat box, but it's utbb.org. We have take action letters there um, that are make it really simple and really easy for people to support the, the work that our tribes are doing to protect our way of life. Um, and I guess I will just wrap up by saying um, we're just so thankful to be a part of this journey. We're so thankful to the organizers for bringing us together. Um, we know that there are people across the nation fighting this same battle. You're going to hear from some of our um, people in Alaska who are fighting very similar battles. And these are battles that have gone on forever. Um, and unfortunately, if we do not fight the real battle here that has to do with individualism and greed and unchecked, unchecked individualism and greed, we are going to continue to fight these battles for eternity. And so beyond setting a letter to the EPA, beyond um, taking action, you know, making sure that your decision makers know how you feel about these things. Please keep resisting, keep fighting, and keep teaching our future generations to value people over profit. Um, it isn't until we fight the real problems here and we fight um, the root of the problem, not just the symptoms of the problem, which is this terrible, <laughs> destructive development that's uh, hurting people across the nation um, and killing our mother earth that we're really going to see true change. So please, please continue to value people over profit and continue to teach our kids to value people over profit. Um, and, and hopefully someday these battles won't be, won't be as prevalent. So thank you so much. Um, I will wrap it up there because I am really excited to hear from the other people. Thank you again. We're just really honored to be a part of this and we really appreciate everybody's support. Alana, thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Joel Jackson, the president of the Organized Village of Cake, to talk about his work to protect the Tongass. Uh, do we have one more elder, uh, one more lady? I prefer to let the ladies talk first. Gloria, are you up for going next? I, I, I sure am. The sooner the better. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> And thank you for the previous speakers because you just, you said everything that I wasn't able to include in mine because of time. So I speak as a citizen of the Hotsahomir Traditional Native Council, a woman of my river and land. I am my river and my river is me. The Kaskokwim River running through and nourishing the land and all life is as vital to me as the blood, the blood of my ancestors pulsing to my body. The people of the river are in my blood from the headwaters to the mouth. Kaskokwim means big, slow moving thing. As it meanders from its origins in the middle of the state of Alaska, it receives other streams and rivers along its 702 miles until it meets the Bering Sea. It is the ninth largest river in the country and the longest free flowing river, flowing through and nourishing boreal forests and tundra. Everything we do is related to the river, the tides and the seasons. Salmon is our life and is supplemented by other fish that dwell and, mi and migrate in the waters. 
the river as well of, as as well as the land are essential for sustaining the food and resources we depend on. The proposed open pit Donlin mine and all that it would bring with it is the single most looming threat to the survival of the Kuskokwim River and the people who depend on it for life. There are 23 sovereign Dene and Yupik, 23 sovereign nations of Dene and Yupik people who live along the river. Research done by the Regional Health Corporation has proven conclusively that the health and well being of the people of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta depends on us having access to our traditional and customary food sources. Not only access, but trust that the environment is healthy and the food we fish, hunt, and gather is free of contamination. With climate change being unpredictable, leaving the land, the water, and the air vulnerable in a way we never imagined, we cannot take the risk that has the potential to totally devastate a land, a river, and a people. This is our land. This is where we belong. Any single failure of these assurances that have no more substance than smoke and mirrors would be catastrophic. Life as we know it will never be the same again. Furthermore, the swathe of mountains cascading throughout the upper Kaskokwim contains naturally occurring mercury. The mercury that will be released into the air through the extraction of gold from tons of ore will add an acceptable burden of cumulative effect on the food we consume. We have among the highest birth, birth rates in our country. We cannot expose our young mothers, mothers to be and babies to this risk. We already experience some of the highest health disparities due to the lack of water and sewer. Diabetes, cancer, heart disease are the leading diseases borne by our population. We are also decimated by suicide and unintentional death and injury not to mention those shackled to the systems that keep us prisoners in Western institutions. This land is our home. The Kaskokrim River is our life. We have nowhere else to go. We do not thrive in cities, hunting in the stores for sustenance and eating welfare food. Our traditions and culture demand that we treat all life with respect. There are rituals and ceremonies that are observed to show our gratitude to our creator and the universe for all that is given and sustains our bodies and souls. We honor that by observing these rites of passage for our young and their contributions to the family's food security. The first salmon of the season, the first moose caught by a young hunter, the first bucket of berries picked by a child, these rituals are done in honor of the gifts we are provided. I don't have the same relationship with a Big Mac or a Whopper as I do with a meal of baked salmon from the first caught salmon of the year or a bowl of a gudak made from berries gathered from the tundra. I trust the land I get from the, I trust the food I get from the land and the river. The whole idea of an open pit resource development in this region or anywhere else for that matter is against where we need to be going. In 2019, a convention of duly gathered delegates passed a resolution opposing the proposed Donlin mine. 35 sovereign nations opposed this development and yet the state of Alaska continues with the permitting process. The state of Alaska has proven to be a poor steward of the land and the resources of the first people of this land. We who have managed and sustained our resources for millennia. Development on the extraction of natural resources must be stopped. Alaska is at ground zero for the effects of climate change. Research has shown that we are exper experiencing these drastic changes at three times the rest of the country is experiencing. As I speak, my people are facing severe fishing restrictions 
limiting our access to our main food supply, salmon. COVID has already put us in a place of food insecurity, and now we are being regulated by both the state and federal governments. Entire fish camps stand empty along the Yukon River. We are restricted from even subsistence harvest. We are all in this together and Mother Earth is crying out in pain. I am my river and my river is me, Liana. Thank you, Gloria. I dropped into the chat a website where people can learn more about the Donling Gold Mine campaign. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Joel Jackson from the Organized Village of Cake. Could you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, um, my name is uh, Joel Jackson. I'm coming to you from my homeland. Uh, we call it Cake Kwan. In the English, it's Cake Alaska located in Southeast Alaska, right in the middle of Southeast Alaska. We're in Central Southeast Alaska. Um, our fight started back in 2001 for the Tungus National Forest. Protecting it from logging and road building. It was put into protection or it was uh, the roadless rule was put in place in, back in 2001. Ever since then, the state of Alaska has worked to try to reverse that rule. And back in 2020, with the Trump administration, uh, they were successful in reversing that rule. We were talking with the Forest Service back then, six tribes, they called us cooperating agencies. And they had six alternatives on the table. One being leaving it alone, leaving it as is, six as full exemption of the roadless rule. We spend almost a year talking with them. We did it on our own time as the organized village of cake. I had myself and about four or five staff members participating in it. We spent thousands of dollars being part of that cooperating agency. <clears throat> and the end, the Forest Service and the USDA decided they're going to go full exemption. And this was while we we're still talking with them. You notice I say talking, not, not in consultation, because it wasn't consultation. And um, as being the president of our tribe, I immediately pulled our tribe out of the cooperating agency because we don't have the money to spend on something that's already been decided and that's what it was. And the other five tribes eventually pulled out too. I know this is about salmon, but the forest, like everybody else, we are tied to our lands and our waters. We are our lands, we are our waters. Without the old growth timber, our salmon streams would not produce the salmon that we have now not near the numbers because the old growth timber provides the shade 
to keep our streams cool. And our salmon, as everybody else has mentioned, is sacred to us. It provides us substance to last one year to the next. We celebrate when the salmon are returning, everybody gets happy because we know we're gonna have that salmon available to us. Last year, the salmon hardly returned to, to our streams. They declared the fish, commercial fishery a disaster. We had to get salmon that was donated by different organizations. They shipped it into us as they did in other rural communities. And we also got hackery fish that was provided to us, which we are thankful for. But we're a proud people. We, we, uh, we are very independent. And it's hard for us to take something that we didn't work for. But we had to do it in, to ensure that our people had enough fish. And the other thing that I want to say is, you know, the, the Tungus National Forest is the last largest tempered rainforest in the world now. It provides like 40% uh, of the absorb, absorb, it absorbs 40% of the carbon out of the air. So they're calling it the lungs of the earth. Without it, we would be struggling, Every would, everybody would be doing that. We would struggle. And somebody mentioned that, you know, it's so important we respect everything, which we do. We are grateful to be able to live on our lands that our ancestors did for over 10,000 years. We have stories that go back, that's been passed on orally. I heard them when I was a young man and I still pass them on today. Of different areas that our people went to when, we, when there was an ice age where they ended up at and the floods where they came, where they drifted off to and they found their way back to our homelands. So, <clears throat> like I said, we're very tied to our lands, very tied to our streams, our waters. They provide for us. As I get older, I find myself find less and less processed meat and food. I mainly live on our salmon, our halibut, our seal, our deer, our moose, because I feel as I get older, I need to go back to our traditional diet and I feel better for it. I don't know how much time I have left, but um, I'd just like to encourage everybody that's listening to come visit our Tungus National Forest. I always describe it as walking into one of the most beautiful cathedrals you'll ever find on this earth. You walk into that forest it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. 
one of the most beautiful places you can walk into this. From what you see, from what you smell, whatever you feel, it's my place where I go to center myself. Because I feel connected to our ancestors. I feel them. I walk on the same forest floor as they do. I walk on the same beaches they have. So it's very, very important we protect our way of life. I hardly ever use the word subsistence. To me, it's our way of life. That's so important where the salmon is so important to us. It provides for us from one year to the next. So if you want to help in any way is to contact your congressmen, your senators, whoever, the USDA, the Forest Service, and let them know that you support our protection of the Tungus National Forest. How important it is to everybody, not just my people, but the whole world. The whole world is dependent on this last temperate rainforest. And I'm blessed to be able to live here. I'm 65 years old. I lived here all my life. I'm sitting here in my, my uh, family home. And I can see the mountains around me and the waters. It brings me peace. So please, if you would, please contact your, your congressmen, your senators, your representatives. Ask them to protect the Tungus National Forest. For generations to come, we look seven generations out. And I want and I hope to get permanent protection of this beautiful place that I call home. I want to thank the organizers for allowing me this honor to speak. And uh, thank you all for listening and uh, have a good evening. Joel, thank you for those powerful words and for reminding us that these struggles um, are, are for all of us, for um, all future generations. And we appreciate your work. I'm gonna uh, kick it over to Ruth Miller, our final speaker. There's not much more that I can say. And I'm so, I'm always so humbled and so grateful um, to have this time in community, even if it's virtual, just listening and learning. Um, and if there's anything left to share, you know, I've been taught that we, we teach and we remember through story. And so there's a, a story that I'd like to tell actually about Alana. And I don't think she knows I was gonna tell this story. Um, but when I was 15, my very first job was with the United Tribes of Bristol Bay out in Dillingham working for the protection of our bay against Pebble Mine. I flew out there young and green and not knowing much about what I was getting into, but Alana was such a guide and such a mentor to me and still is today. Um, I was so nervous knowing that this was uh, the work I was meant to do, but um, feeling unequipped and um, you know, the first day came around when I was supposed to go into the office and I had to call her up and I had to tell Lana, hey, I just can't come in today. The fish hit the set net and we gotta go pick them. It's time to go smoke fish. And she said, get off the phone and go hurry. <laughs> and that day I never went into the office. You know, I never met the rest of the United Tribes of Bristol Bay team. I processed our fika, I processed our salmon with the family opening their home to me, family that I now call my family. And uh, 
you know, in the years since it's been such a constant reminder that that was my first work doing environmental justice work. That was my first day doing um, work to protect our lands and our waters was spending time with the precious, the precious creations that we're fighting so hard to protect. Um, Alana taught me so much in that moment and throughout the rest of our time together. You know, she taught me how to drink black coffee and, and how to make scrambled eggs in the microwave. But she also taught me how important it is to make everyone care about this issue. That work that I did that summer uh, mostly was talking to fishermen in the harbor, reminding them of not only how important our salmon are, how important our jobs are, how important our communities are. And that work is still what is calling us to action now. The issue of Bristol Bay, that Bristol Bay faces, the issue of Pebble Mine has always been an intertribal issue from across different cultures. The Lutic, the Dene'ina and Yupik peoples have come together to advocate for the protection of our lands and waters. And today we come together from different parts of Alaska, from different parts of the country, uh, reminding one another of how crucial it is that we stand together, form strong alliances and uh, advocate uh, for our shared communal rights to a healthy way of life, to honor our ancestors' ways of life, and to make sure that our descendants have access to those ways of life. Through the, natural, the work of the Natural History Museum with Becca, we are so excited to, continuing, to continue to partner with the Yurok, the Lummi and the Nez Perce uh, nations who are working on their own salmon protection struggles and have come together in collaboration to tell the story of what it means to be deeply connected to our food systems, deeply connected to our cultural practices, um, our ways of life, and the ways that across the Pacific Northwest we can join in solidarity and to elevate our different unique cultures uh, coming together around our shared love of our our salmon and uh, the shared importance of the continuation of this food system. In the next week, in fact, I will be traveling to, uh, to join the Winnemuntu tribe uh, performing their sixth annual run for salmon, a prayer run for salmon restoration um, in their watershed to bring home the wind and the salmon that they know and have tended to for millennia who have now been devastated in their watersheds by the Shasta Dam and by agricultural and industrial development. Across our country, we share this imperative uh, to continue the protection and the stewardship of our lands and waters. And now when I think back to those first days uh, of my salmon protection work, being with the fish, you know, brining them, drying them, smoking them, canning them, you know, it, 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 it's almost haunting to me. It's, it's a blessing um, and a nightmare knowing that that is all that we have to lose. Um, that sense of who we are, you know. Um, Joel spoke about the importance of the Tongass protecting our streams, keeping the waters cool. And I immediately began thinking of last year when me and my family went out to fish and we just had to stare heartbroken as the salmon in the bottom of the riverbed were hardly moving, dying of heat stroke as our waters continue to warm. And so the imperative for intertribal gathering uh, for collaboration across peoples is more important now than ever as we continue to face the impending climate crisis for our homelands and for our ways of life. You know, what would it mean to protect Bristol Bay against the pebble mine, but to have our salmon be devastated all the same by warming waters from the continuation of destruction of the Amazon and the uh, traditional homelands of our Southern relatives there? We are all in this together. And as we begin our um, time of healing, it means that we must take action and collaboration together. It means we must remember the importance of alliance building. Here through Native Movement in Alaska, we are um, the primary facilitators of the Alaska Climate Alliance, which is carving space for our um, predominantly white-led conservationist allies uh, to step up to the table to begin to meaningfully integrate indigenous solidarity and deference to um, indigenous self-determination in their conservation and lands protection work. So we are beginning to carve out space and, and provide direction for environmentalists and conservation groups to remember that any work protecting the lands and waters must involve, um, must from the start engage the leadership and the wisdom of 
those lands and waters, indigenous peoples. Uh, through that alliance building, we are also taking up this moment of national action to push the present infrastructure bill to encompass all that climate action must include. We don't just want recovery. We don't just want job creation. We have to include climate in any infrastructure package that purports to provide relief for our country. We are encouraging um, all constituents to call their representatives and remind them that if climate and environmental justice is not included in this recovery bill, then there should be no deal. And that now is the moment to act in the defense of our lands and waters. You can learn more at thriveagenda.org on this important moment on national legislation. Um, and I really, really encourage folks to support as well the Winning Wintu tribe and their uh, traditional run for them. And I'm so honored to be here with each of you and I, I want to discussion. Um, but this is the moment to find your place in this fight and to step up to the plate uh, to make sure that you are leaving a legacy of righteousness and bravery and courageousness for your descendants to remember you by. So chicken, thank you all so much. Ruth, thank you. And thank you to all of our speakers tonight. Um, I want to acknowledge and um, thank also the other organizations involved in organizing the Red Road to DC Totem Pole Journey Project and these virtual journey events, Native Organizers Alliance, Illuminative, and Cecila, um, as well as, of course, the House of Tears Carvers who are making this all possible for us to come together. We're coming close to the top of the hour and the close of this event, but I just want to lift up something that I heard each of our speakers tonight talk about, which is these fights to protect the Tongass, the Bristol Bay watershed, the Yukon, Kuskokwin Delta, um, the salmon in our waters um, can be understood as environmental fights or environmental justice fights. They can be understood as political fights, um, but they're much, much deeper than that. The totem pole, um, that the Lummi are transporting is not reducible to its material characteristics. It is a carved and painted Western red cedar log, but it is not reducible to its material value. Its power is not as a commodity. It's really about how it functions in the world in a reciprocal relationship with the indigenous and non-indigenous people and communities who invest their power and prayers um, and hopes um, for the future and for the protection of these places for the generations to come. And it is about a way of relating to the land, not as a collection of objects or resources, not something a person or a corporation can own. It doesn't belong to an individual, but rather a collective of generations past, present, and future indigenous and non-indigenous, humans and non-humans, the water and the land. And so in this time, as our society's institutions are being called to decolonize or grapple with structural racism with American history, um, monuments are toppling, uh, we're, asked, uh, the, we're, we're asked the question of what takes their place what histories and values um, and ways of being and relating are we choosing to carry forward into the future? So a big thank you to Alana, to Gloria, to Joel and to Ruth for sharing with us um, their, uh, their work, um, their fights for their community, for their life ways, for the salmon and for our collective future. We can't thank you enough and I invite everyone to get involved in each of these campaigns that our speakers have talked about. Um, and, and yes, for recognizing our matriarchs, thank you um, for the work that you do in, in caring um, for the source of life and for the future. I do want to um, invite, uh, I, I also want to acknowledge and thank the sponsors um, of today's event, the people who really helped to pull it off as well. Um, thank you to the Sierra Club, to Wilberforce Foundation and to NDN Collective. 
Um, I think we have time to close with a short video. Abby, if you're ready to cue this up, um, this Friday, uh, there's an exhibition at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian opening up about the totem pole journeys um, that we worked on with the House of Tears Carvers. And this is a video from that. It'll give you a sense of the spirit of the journey and how it connects to these um, Alaska struggles to protect the salmon, the water, and the land. Abby, the audio on that isn't playing out loud. Did you say no audio? No audio, yeah. Let's try it one more time. The total pool journey doesn't draw a new line as much as it traces over one that already exists, making it visible. This line runs through the rocks, through the trees, through the sky, through the oceans. The burial grounds of the ancestors weren't only on the land, their bodies were also pushed out to sea. This is why it's not just the land that is sacred, it is also the water. Lessons were taught centuries ago that have been passed down for generations, lessons that guide us as stewards of the earth. The ancestors in this way speak through us to ensure the health of future generations. So it's also a line that runs from past to present and into the future. Today we face a great challenge. There's a prophecy that tells of a day when the rivers and skies turn black, the fish and the animals die. But it also speaks of a time when people will stand together to stop this from happening. What's happening in the world today is the result of a perspective that sees everything as a resource to be exploited. It's killing Mother Earth. It threatens life on the planet. People and animals are suffering. They're dying of cancers resulting from the air and the water being poisoned. But they are also fighting back. The totem pole journey is a project that makes visible the struggle for life. It brings awareness to the connectedness of the people to the earth and to history. It ties together communities who are living on the front line of the environmental emergency. It makes the commonality of their suffering visible and strengthens the bonds of solidarity between them. As the totem pole travels from place to place and comes into contact with more and more people, it grows more powerful. People who touch it give it power and it gives power to them. The journey also spreads the story of the prophecy and in doing so, it draws a line in the sand. The road that leads to death is not an option. The world is not made up of dead objects, resources to be burned. At this point in history, we are summoning all the forces of life that run through everything to come together in the common collective fight. From the ancestors to our grandchildren, Kwahoi, we draw the line. Thanks, Abby. And maybe our panelists could uh, come on to video for a second to um, so that we can all say thank you and and the little baby. <laughs> thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing and for joining us tonight. And thank you everybody for attending tonight's event. We have uh, some more virtual journey events coming up uh, July 7th and July 8th. Uh, July 7th brings together um, uh, folks from the Arctic, Bernadette from Gwich'in Steering Committee and Regina from Women of Bears Years. Uh, after we screen a short film by Lynn Nessifer, a Diné filmmaker, activist, and scholar called uh, Welcome to Guichaji, and which connects both uh, the Arctic and Bears Years struggles for sacred places. And on July 8th, we'll screen Our Last Refuge and hear from leaders from Blackfeet Nation, 
who are working to protect uh, Badger 2 medicine. Uh, and more events up on the Red Road to DC website. And again, thank you to everybody and have a great night. Thank you, it was very good and, and I am honored. I, Joe, my two, my two um, youngest grandchildren are Tinklets. I don't know what what relationship you are to Jeff, but he's there. He's they're part of the blended family, and my oldest granddaughter is Guichen. So mm -hmm. all of this is very meaningful to me because it we're all related. Guyana for this opportunity. Thank you, Guyana. Yes, thank you, and you all have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. See you on the Red Road.